Hi, good afternoon, uh, and welcome to this HDB webinar. My name is Phil Bicknell. Uh, I'm the Market Intelligence Director here at AHDB. So we're the team that do a lot of the uh, market intelligence around prices, what's happening in commodity markets. We've also done an awful lot to uh, to look at uh, some of the EU exit implications for our industry as well. So I'm really pleased you've uh, you've been able to join us today. Um, Europe and the EU has obviously been a key customer for a range of our agri-food products for several decades. And when it comes to rules and regulations, operating as part of that single market, well, that's made it as easy and straightforward to supply customers in Berlin or Barcelona as it was customers in Birmingham. But all that's changed, of course. And although we've got a trade agreement in place which avoided tariffs, I think it's some of the non-tariff barriers that businesses have been wrestling with in the first few weeks of this year. Um, over the next hour or so, we're going to be hearing from uh, some of those that have experienced uh, some of the challenges and getting their views, particularly trying to get uh, a take on whether it's a short-term blip to trading patterns that we're experiencing uh, or whether we're going through a more fundamental period of adjustment. I'm trying to think particularly in terms of are the non-tariff issues that we're seeing now, are they effectively going to become big trade barriers for our UK exporters? And if that's the case, what are some of the knock-on impacts that businesses in the supply chain are going to face and how does that filter back to us at the farm gate? We also want to take the opportunity to look, to look beyond Brexit. So what are the opportunities ahead for the UK food sector? How can the industry add value through accessing new markets around the world? So trying to think about longer term and bigger picture. Uh, before we uh, move on to our, uh, to our panel and hear from our first speaker, just a, a bit of housekeeping to kick off with. Um, if you can all stay muted throughout, uh, you will all stay muted throughout the webinar. Um, we're due to finish at uh, two o'clock, so we will aim to stick to time as far as possible. To ask questions through the webinar, uh, you can do this by opening the questions panel, which should be shown on the right hand of your screen. And you can keep the questions coming in at any time. Uh, we'll, um, so just as the, the first speaker get out of the way, if you bring the questions to us, we'll pick those up in the Q&A uh, later on. If there's any technical issues as well that you're experiencing, again, use the uh, Q&A panel box at the side of the screen to let us know. We are recording the webinar and it will be published on uh, the HDB website and on our YouTube channel. So that's where you'll be able to get hold of uh, some of the information and slides if you want to revisit any of the content. You will be prompted to answer a survey at the end of the webinar. Uh, we really appreciate the time and effort you take to complete this so that we can improve on the webinars and the content that we provide. So right, that's housekeeping done with. Uh, let's kick on uh, with our first speaker. Um, I'd like to introduce Mike Gooding, who's the director of Farmers Fresh. Um, Mike, just to, to be great to hear from you for a few minutes and perhaps uh, if you could touch on a little bit in terms of uh, Farmers Fresh and their, their history, the background. Um, also, I'm really conscious that sheep was a really uh, fundamental issue in a no-deal situation. That was avoided, but what sort of practical challenges are you now encountering as a business, and what does that mean in terms of cost? I'd also really appreciate uh, if you could maybe touch on what your longer-term uh, views are around the prospects for the UK sheep export. Thanks, Mike. Over to you. Thank you very much, Phil. And if I achieve that in five minutes, it will be remarkable, actually. I, uh, and I have to say, looking at myself on the screen, I can see the difference between a pre-lockdown and a current haircut. So uh, uh, that's one thing we all definitely need to get back to. Heather, thank you. If I could have the uh, first slide. Before I talk uh, about where we see the future, and that's really what I would like to fo focus on, it's important, I think, just to reiterate why it is Farmers First is in, in business and what it is we're trying to achieve, because we fundamentally have a different position to perhaps some of the other uh, major processes. And that does uh, affect both our thinking for the future and also the things that we've gone through over recent months. The aim of the business, for um, those of you who remember right the way back to Farmers Ferry in the late 1990s, is to re improve the returns to UK livestock producers. Uh, and that remains our, the primary aim of the business. And we seek to do that through creating trading opportunities. So from our very inception as the ferry all of those years ago, it, it has been about the develop of export trading opportunities. And that is primarily where our focus 
uh, sits. Uh, and I always find it a certain irony. If you see the original uh, ferry there, you can see uh, it, it, it flies under the French tricolor. The savior of the UK sheep industry was a French ship. There's, there's irony in this, this day and age. Thank you, Heather. If you could flick on to the next slide. And, and, and to explain to everybody why Farmers First is slightly different and how we're structured, uh, we are a limited company. We have about 2,750 farmer shareholders who are all over the UK. The average shareholding is about 450 shares, something like that. So there is an awful lot of relatively small shareholders. And we essentially set the business up as a, as a cooperative, at least in its thinking and its ethos, although we very deliberately have a limited company legal structure rather than a, a cooperative membership arrangement. And part of that structure is no individual can own more than 5% of the shares. So we set the business up to make sure that the farmers all over the UK who own the business retain the ownership of the company. And for the fourth year, those farmer shareholders will receive a, a dividend if they vote in the upcoming uh, AGM to do so. And that's one of the routes that we have found to get value back to farmers. So for us, not only can we do our best to drive the demand side of the equation by getting out there and being active in the export markets, but it also means that we can return value in terms of dividend to farmer shareholders. The majority of the board remain farmers, but we very clearly employ the best executive skills and the team who actually run operations. And that's another uh, essential difference to the business. We recognised early on uh, where our failings are and employed the right people to actually run the day-to-day -day business. We procure stock direct into the plants, but we also buy through about 70 livestock auctions right away across uh, the UK. But one of our fundamental differences, and this is really key to our activity going forward, is we essentially procure stock to fulfill orders. We don't go out to buy stock at, at the lowest price we can find and then sell it to make the greatest margin. We, we identify orders with customers and we procure stock to fulfill those orders. So we've really tried to shrink and, and vertically integrate the supply chain. There are very few people uh, who are uh, in, the, uh, uh, in that supply chain from livestock farmer through to end customers. 75% of what we do is exported to the EU. About 2% currently is exported outside the EU. And over the last few years, we have built more supply into the UK market, but it is still a relatively small part of our business. So in reality, Phil, for us, the 1st of January was a very key date. Um, and if things had gone differently, we might be having a very different presentation uh, today. Uh, the export market to the EU for us as a business uh, was not only uh, important, it was fundamental. And without of it, we may well not have had a business. One final point of, of reference for everybody is we don't do any direct retailer supply. We actually supply wholesale customers, some of whom may well further process and go on to supply retailer customers. But we made a strategic decision early on that we would not supply retailers direct. And that has actually given us freedom as a business to be able to work in all sorts of different markets in different parts of, of the world. And that too is a critical difference between us and other, uh, other processors. We are not necessarily looking for only 20 kilo R3L lamb carcasses to supply an individual retailer. We have a much wider wider basket. Thank you, Heather. You could cut the slides uh, uh, there if you like. So, um, yeah, as I was saying, the 1st of January was a significant day for us. The fact that we could continue to trade with Europe ha has been a, a saviour. 
although it has not been easy, the practical challenges we have been having since the 1st of January, and we started back um, exporting on the 2nd of January, um, has been that the rules and regulations continue to change. And that's been a major, uh, major problem for us. We in fact have at least one full-time employee in both of our abattoirs whose entire life is spent trying to deal with rule and regulation changes. That has settled down a little bit over the last few weeks. I'd say it's not settled because the rules and regulations have become any clearer. It's settled because we've got better at dealing with the system such as it is. And that I can see being an ongoing problem for a number of months. The second major uh, problem is, uh, frankly, the system is just not fit for purpose, uh, unfortunately. Here we are in the 21st century, and we're back to operating with hard copy documents and wet signatures that have to be completed and signed off before the lorry leaves the abattoir. And then it goes with the lorry through the process from country to country across Europe. This, it seems to be and is, an archaic approach to 21st century trading. And I have to say to uh, anybody who has aspirations to make the UK a, a, you know, an international trading giant, we just have to get better and more appropriate systems in place. The reality is that it now takes us a day longer to get from Kenilworth to Paris with a load of lamb. It used to be 24 hours, it's now 48 hours on average and every day lost in shelf life is a day uh, that allows competitors into the marketplace. So there is a, a very real trade uh, uh, concern. The third, Ella, the third challenge we have is that the rules are open to interpretation. And every time you go across another border control point and through another set of veterinary or customs checking, it really rather depends on, on what mood the inspector is in at that point. And every time we have a, a, a ding dong in the press with our politicians expressing their view of Europe, you find that a UK truck gets delayed uh, a, a little bit longer. So these are things that we really need to grow up and grow out of and move on into an environment where we can get trade flowing as effectively as it used to flow before uh, the 1st of January. So that's where we are at the moment. That's the background to the business and the existing challenges. Perhaps we'll go on, Phil, to talk later about where we see the future and where we see the real opportunities. Because at the end of the day, we're very grateful to still be in business and we're very optimistic about what the future brings. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, we'll definitely pick that up, I think, in, in terms of the Q&A and kind of where we see that, uh, maybe, or where you see the, some of that balance uh, in terms of your customer base and trade going forward. Um, I'd like to introduce Nicola Thomas now. Uh, Nicholas is director with the Food and Drinks Export Association. And uh, Nicola, I'd be really interested to, to hear from you uh, from a top line perspective in terms of what the, what the big issues have been for food and drink exporters. Mike, of course, talked about some of the some of the challenges from the sheep meat perspective and some uh, some pretty staggering numbers around the you know effectively doubling the amount of time for delivery the the uh the time of the paperwork and some of the issues there be interesting to see or to get your view about how widespread that is and and in what sorts of sectors um again also really keen to to kind of get a view about the longer term so what further opportunities from your perspective do we face, do we have as a global britain Great, thanks, Phil. Uh, next slide, please, Heather. So, hi, everyone. And uh, yeah, I rep really representing the view of added value manufacturers and processors who are either members of the Food and Drink Exporters Association, which does what it says on the tin, um, or who exhibit with us at trade shows around the world as part of the British Pavilion. Um, and I think our 
members have really managed to do very well getting to grips with uh, the new regulations and the new world uh, since, the, since the 1st of January. We have a fortnightly Zoom chat with our members and um, I think the sort of level of anxiety and the issues that people are facing have definitely gone down over the last two and a half months. Um, we had a call on Friday and like Mike said, there's still a lot of, um, a lot of it seems to be hit and miss as to, you know, who the customs officer is and you can send three identical consignments to get through, one doesn't. Um, the, the talk on Friday was around issues still with rules of origin and around groupage. But as I say, most people having done now shipped a few orders to Europe are sort of getting through it. And I think very much there's a, a feeling that, that it's short term headaches rather than long term barriers uh, in the main. And that, that is a generalisation. Um, and I think that Brexit is a headache still, but it's part of a bigger basket of challenges that exporters are facing principally caused by COVID. Um, the landscape has changed so much for exporters over the last 12 months. Consumers around the world have got different priorities. Um, so as a result of COVID, they're worried about their health, they're worried about um, food safety, they're staying local, um, they're eating at home. Um, so they, they're very much you know, become new animals. Um, and I think there's a question mark around whether that is short term or whether those sort of trends are here to stay for the, the, the medium and long term. Challenges uh, around channels for exporters. Obviously, grocery retailers account for the lion's share of sales, but food services dropped off a cliff. Um, and new channels like convenience and uh, vending, direct to consumer and e-commerce in general are gaining more provenance. And also, who would have thought a year ago that we would be reaching for so much frozen food, canned food and shelf stable products. Um, so all of those elements are making it very difficult for exporters to, to forecast and work out what's coming down the, down the tubes. Um, Brands and distributors have had mixed fortunes. Um, bigger brands who have got, who work with big distributors and are supplying the multiple retailers around the world uh, are not only doing well, but many of them, business is absolutely booming and their challenge is keeping up with uh, the demand. And smaller challenger brands um, who are perhaps working with niche distributors, they're having quite a tough time because their distributors ha are having products delisted by the retailers, food service and specialist outlets are shut, um, and also they're finding it quite difficult to get airtime with buyers. And also for you as exporters, building and maintaining relationships is a whole lot harder simply because you can't get out to markets, you can't go and visit customers and prospects, you can't cruise up and down the supermarket aisles looking at competitors, um, and you can't go to trade shows. So I think that Brexit is definitely uh, causing some issues, but I don't think it's the root of all evil at the moment for exporters. Next slide, please, Heather. So I think, Actually, there's a lot of reasons that we, sh we can be optimistic and there are lots of opportunities going into um, the second quarter of 2021. Uh, those of you who already export outside of the EU will be all too familiar with export barriers, which have been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So uh, quotas, export bans, import bans, tariffs, currency fluctuations, mountains of paperwork. That's nothing new. So it is something that those those of you who've only ever exported to the EU uh, will come to terms with and it, and it will get easier. Um, the EU is very much open for business from what we're seeing. We're seeing retailers and distributors um, looking for new products from the UK. Uh, we've got a Meet the Buyer event next week and 16 countries are going to be represented and it's split exactly 50-50 EU, non-EU. So I think I think hopefully that's a good practical signal that uh, distributors are still interested in the UK. And the underlying global sector drivers are still very much in evidence. So grocery retail spend is increasing across the world. 
food and drink is reasonably recession proof so although we may be suffering from a recession uh, people still need to to eat and drink and the key consumer groups like middle classes millennials and gen z who've got the money and the desire to buy imported products are growing in most markets around the world and one thing that we've got on our side in the UK is that we are very much at the forefront of lots of retail and uh, manufacturing trends. So whether that's premiumization, health and wellness um, or convenience. And that means that for you as manufacturers, you've got a, a real opportunity to extend the life cycle and the revenues from your current range by selling them in markets where those trends are just moving from niche to mainstream. And I think the door is very much open for that, particularly because of the power of Made in Britain, which is a universally recognised hallmark of quality, of heritage, of innovation and security. And I think that consumers around the world are looking to buy products from a safe source. They want to buy from trustworthy suppliers um, and from socially responsible companies. And I think UK suppliers very much fit that bill. And also, you're not alone. If you're an exporter, you want to manufacture product and you want to sell it. You don't have to be an expert in compliance, in logistics, in labeling, etc., because you're surrounded by a network of people like AHDB, like ourselves, like banks, like professional organizations, like DIT, who can hold your hand and help you to do uh, all the kind of back office stuff, which means that you can focus on the manufacturing and the selling. Next slide, please, Heather. So, uh, in terms of opportunities, um, I'm not going to give you a market and say let's all rush off to uh, to a particular country. I think that because of Brexit, because of COVID, because where where we are, that this is an ideal opportunity if you are already exporting or if you're thinking about exporting to just take stock uh, for the time being and to think about how you can drive exports because a lot of companies start off exporting in a really ad hoc way. They meet somebody at a trade show, they get an inquiry and all of a sudden exports start to snowball and you're sending out samples, doing prices, getting into long email exchanges before you actually work out whether the market is the right one for your products and for your company. So I would suggest that you start off by looking at your, uh, your company, look at your capabilities and your export goals. So things like how far are you prepared to adapt your products and packaging for export? How much human and financial resource have you got to throw at overseas sales? Are you going to be proactive or reactive? And how many of those nearly 100, uh, 200 markets around the world uh, can you actually do justice to if you put as much energy into it as you do in the UK? Once you've done that, um, I think you need to look at ident identifying the right priority markets for your brand and for your company. So you need to uh, ideally build a balanced portfolio between EU and non-EU markets but look at where are consumers for your market, for your products? Uh, have they got money? Uh, can you actually sell at a profit? Are there any showstoppers in that market, any uh, trading barriers, which mean that actually it's probably not a good idea to rush off there? And having done that, I would then try to find the best fit partners. So not just the, that first person who you've met at a trade show or who's emailed you. Um, you need to find somebody who's going to be the best representative for your brand that you possibly can. Um, and I think you know, if you follow those three um, maybe obvious steps, but they're certainly not what we see happen in, uh, in reality, um, that you'll be really well set up for uh, 2021 and beyond with your exports. Thanks, Nicola. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll perhaps come back to uh, to some of those points in the in the discussion in a in a few minutes. Um, next, we're going to hear from uh, from somebody who's probably you know, taken those three steps and uh, and been very effective at those as well. So I'd like to introduce Stephen Jones, who's the managing director with um, Summerdale International. And uh, Stephen, so I'm kind of interested for to hear a bit from you because I know that uh, perhaps a, a bit different to Mike and the the sheep meat exports you. From a dairy perspective, from a cheese perspective, you've probably focused a bit more on the non-EU exports. So, really interested to hear your 
your take in terms of some of the non-tariff barriers we're uh, we're experiencing. And I suppose, um, yeah, not to, to pick up too much on on Nicholas' point, but when I look at global dairy consumption, the forecast are for it to grow. So, what's the potential from your angle? Thank you, Mike. Um, sorry, Phil. Uh, yes, so Summerdale, I'm Stephen Jones. Summerdale International was um, established by myself and my business partner in 1990. So we're just uh, coming up 30 years old as a dairy export trading company. So we don't manufacture cheese. We uh, work with a certain number of producers. And uh, we sort of very, very small with about a 3 million turnover. We now uh, have about 45 million turnover. Uh, not all uh, dairy, but predominantly dairy, predominantly cheese, milk powders, those sort of things. Um, EU and worldwide, but um, one reason is that we're more sort of worldwide is that uh, a lot of EU uh, customers could deal directly with the manufacturers. There wasn't really a space for us, but um, but but we still do that. So let me just touch on the um, EU first of all, um, and I'll I'll endorse what Mike was saying. Um, you know, and and Phil earlier that it was it was very easy uh, for the last forty years to stick a pallet on a truck tomorrow and have it the next day in. Spain, France, all over Europe, limited number of paperwork. I mean, life was life was pretty simple. Um, so I think what you know we're coming to terms. We we heard at the end of December there was a deal done. Boris had done a deal and shouting very much about it. We thought, well, there's no WTO terms, there's no uh, tariffs or anything like that. We're we're going to be able to carry on, but um, that's really far from the case. Um, we now have to really deal with the EU as a third country, as do, say, Australia, New Zealand, America, if they want to sell into the EU. Um, we're under very much those sort of terms. But because we're not, you know, we haven't practiced it, it's, we're, we're learning. And it is a big learning curve. And we've had cheese, uh, quite a substantial amount of cheese going into Holland this year. Um, and it's taken a lot of red tape, a lot of paperwork, um, health certificates in three languages, uh, just very simple things like a species of origin we used to put down as bovine. Well, in fact, it's actually domestic cow is Bostaurus, which um, I didn't know anything about. But um, when it gets to Dunkirk, we suddenly find that that's not correct. So it's just about, you know, taking the right boxes, being precise. And, and, and it's not going to go away. We've got to get used to it. Um, someone said to me, um, you know, you deal in China. If you can deal in China, you can deal in the EU. But it is it is that hard. And I think um, that's going to be something that, um, that we're going to have to live with. Uh, it's going to cost money because obviously every health certificate costs money, um, inspections cost money, delays cost money. So there will be a lot more red tape. There will be a lot of extra cost. And, um, and I think we've got to live with this. And, and if we want to deal in Europe, that's what we're going to do. There is still good potential. I say, you know, we sell cheddar cheese there and we've got some very good quality cheddar cheese that's going into um, some supermarket slicing products and things like that. And, um, and, and it's, it's got potential. Um, there are a lot of other difficulties. I sympathize with people I talk to in the uh, confectionery industry or the, the, um, the, the bakery industry where they've got imported flour and imported sugar coming from different destinations and doing certificates of analysis, typical origin, very, very difficult. So it's, it's big challenges, but, but the EU is there and it's a consumer and, um, and we've got to learn to live with it. One um, slight issue is we have traditionally we've um, had customers in Asia, Far East, New Zealand that would consolidate in Europe. I mean, um, Rungis in France is a big consolidation area for exports. So uh, for Canada, for instance, we would deliver product into Canada, into uh, Rungis. It would go in a container with French, Italian, Swiss or, or Dutch cheeses and go off to Canada or New Zealand. That's not possible now. And once you go into the EU, re-exporting out of the EU to a non-EU country is virtually impossible, um, partially because of health certificates and the way the community is set up. So that's an area that's a big, big challenge for us. Um, so, you know, we've had to look at other ways of doing things. I'm talking to, strangely, a sort of a long-time competitor who sells product to New Zealand by that method, and I was selling to New Zealand by that method. So we're looking at trying to work together, say, can we ship direct to New Zealand without having to go through Holland? Um, so it's interesting how, you know, our whole life has changed, not just through COVID, we've changed the way of eating and shopping, but we're also looking at ways we're having to do business differently um, to cope with these, these formalities. So that's that's Europe. Well, let's um, look outside of Europe because our largest um, export market for Somerdale is the United States. And to my surprise, last Thursday, um, it was announced that uh, there'd been a retaliatory duty, a 25% retaliatory duty 
that have been imposed on us by um, the Trump administration back about 18 months ago because of the long-term uh, dispute between uh, subsidies to Airbus and Boeing. And um, the WTO ruled that, um, that, the, that uh, the EU was in the wrong and the US could impose 25% duties, not just on dairy, but on confectionery. The uh, Scotch whiskey guys have been hit really badly because um, they've been put on malt whiskey, but not on Irish whiskey. So uh, they were disadvantaged. So suddenly, uh, really out of the blue, this announcement came and I was going to ring up Liz Truss and pat her on the back and say, thank you very much. I thought she had done something for the UK, a special deal, but it does appear that the whole of Europe is, uh, has, has that advantage now. But, but that's, you know, that's the thing that frees up. That 25% we had to live with, um, our specialty cheeses had to bear that sort of cost. We, we ate into our margins and things like that. But, um, it, you know, it's a good sign that, 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 you know, maybe things are opening up. Um, if we look to the rest of the world markets, um, there are opportunities and, and we've worked hard, really hard for the last five or 10 years on China, um, China and Southeast Asia, which um, I would still say, you know, if you've got, if you've got the energy for a long, hard slog, those are good emerging markets. You know, they've got growth markets. Um, we're working closely with um, Costco, the US um, big retailer that opened in Shanghai just over a year ago, and it's opening its second one and will open, no doubt, large numbers. Um, there's, there's, a, there's general demand for Western lifestyle. Um, many of the sort of Chinese have traveled. I mean, you know, part of the problem at the moment is Chinese are not traveling, but I mean, 60% of people traveling uh, a year and a half ago were Chinese and, um, and they're experiencing Western lifestyle. They have money, they have disposable income. They want to buy French wine. They want to buy imported food products, uh, not just for the prestige, but also for safety. Um, one good thing we have about UK food manufacturing is food safety and it's often ignored because we just cope with it every day. We, we know the food is safe and things to eat, but when you're living in China and some of the horrific things that go on there, um, if you've got, dispose of enough money, you will buy imported foodstuffs because you know they're safe if you're going to feed them to your children and that sort of thing. And also, by people traveling, they've adopted more Western lifestyles. Cheese in particular um, has been, to be fair, it's been led by people like Pizza Hut, McDonald's. They've, they've introduced cheese into these markets and people have survived and eaten it abroad. And uh, when they go back and they, they have good jobs and they want to impress their friends, they will, they will buy some nice English cheddar, some French cheese, uh, and and entertain. So the Asian market is 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 um, very attractive. Um, a lot of those countries we're seeing growth in places like Malaysia, Vietnam, um, South Korea. Uh, great opportunities. I mean, our only problem is I mentioned earlier logistics. Um, getting the stuff there, uh, if you can't sell full containers, is is quite difficult. But there are great opportunities. Um, but it's it's hard work. I mean, getting products listed into Vietnam, going through the Registration is very, very difficult. Um, <clears throat> but something Nicola talked about is, is Britain has a great, great prestige. Um, I, I just do business in Malaysia and my importer there says, look, you know, we've got the same education system. We've got the same legal system. We've adapted from you or we've adopted, you know, when we were a, a Malaysian um, co colony. And, and Britain means a lot to us. And yet we see very little British product here. Um, so I think uh, we don't, we don't, talk enough about our, our food hygiene, about our animal husbandry, um, about the, you know, made, made in Britain. I think we could do a lot more of that. We try to do that. We have a, a brand called Westminster, which um, has pictures of London buses, London taxis, uh, London telephone, uh, red telephone boxes. And it means a lot. People pick those up and they know, they know it's prestige. So I think um, I'm very optimistic about uh, growth opportunities, uh, particularly in dairy. I think more people are eating it. I think despite the fact, you know, there is a, a growth in um, sort of vegan demands and things like that. There's still a good demand for good quality British dairy products. And so I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that uh, even with Brexit, um, as soon as people get traveling again, I think that's the key to the thing, people traveling, they, they experience different markets, different um, different cuisines. And I think that's that will liven things up. And I think people will want to go out and spend, hopefully. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic concur with you there Stephen so yeah um, kind of really interesting and perhaps the uh, we've done quite a bit of work at HDB looking at um, Asian Pacific markets in particular and some of the, the consumer profiles there and the demands and 
you know, agree with you in terms of the the visualization, the iconography around kind of great British foods that uh, that we can capitalize on. We'll perhaps come back to some of that in terms of the the Q and A and discussion afterwards. Just a quick reminder for uh, folks: if you have got some questions, then uh, please uh, put them into the poll on the right hand side of the screen. Um, the first person we're going to hear from uh, before we uh, before we open up for uh, a bit more broad discussion is Michael Haverty. And Michael's a partner and uh, senior research consultant with the Anderson Centre. Uh, Michael, we've, we've uh, heard quite a bit, I suppose, in the UK press around Northern Ireland border issues. It'd be great to get your kind of take on some of the key issues uh, there for agri-food businesses. And also to get your kind of view uh, a little bit in terms of the, to what extent are we, are we seeing businesses encountering teething problems versus the longer term challenges for them? So, Michael, over to Thank you very much, Phil. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so in terms of the issues that we've seen uh, with regards to the UK-EU trading relationship and also the GB to Northern Ireland uh, trade flows, it really centres on the issues of non-tariff measures. And you can see up on your screen, there are a range of uh, different uh, topics and issues uh, in terms of those NTM costs that businesses since January have now had to incur. And the analysis that we've done on this uh, would identify between 25 to 30 different cost subcategories uh, which have emerged uh, as a result of the transition period ending. Three key areas to focus on in that context, customs procedures and customs declarations, the rules of origin effects, which we have heard the previous speakers talk about, that's where 85% or more uh, of the product by weight uh, needs to be uh, qualifying in terms of origin in order for it to be traded, exported from the UK to the EU, for example. And also sanitary and phytosanitary costs are a major issue as well. And these three key issues plus others give rise to a whole range of different costs in terms of certification costs, administration time, but particularly in terms of delays around regulatory checks. And you'll see up on your screen the physical check rates uh, on products um, going between the UK and the EU and between Britain and Northern Ireland as well. And for the likes of um, chilled dairy products, it's a 30% physical check rates. Uh, red meat, uh, beef and lamb, that's at 15%. And that in particular is uh, causing friction on the border and uh, at the border control post because for UK exports to the EU, those uh, controls have become effective from January, whereas elsewhere, as a result of the UK border operating model on imports into the UK, they're being introduced on a phased basis. And this in particular is causing friction around Northern Ireland and the protocol, and that has the potential to become even more pronounced as well because of the certification that would eventually be required on uh, products uh, for supermarkets going into Northern Ireland. And as we know, there has been a delay to the grace period. Uh, it was initially for three months. The UK government is now wanting to push that to October. That is causing some friction. But all of these issues taken together do result uh, in significant increased costs to trade, which is what we've seen recently. Next slide, please. And in terms of those non-tariff measure costs, we've been involved in some studies estimating that. And we've looked at it from both the perspective of a load that's subject to the full range of regulatory checks, the so-called unlucky load. And these uh, loads and what we've seen initially uh, in the uh, early phases of the trade and cooperation agreement being implemented, there have been some significant delays, which in turn have contributed to significant costs. If we take red meat as an example, anywhere between five up to 28% in some scenarios can be the ad valorem equivalent cost if your goods are subject to checks and also sampling. However, if you average it out across a, a 100 loads on a probability basis, those uh, ad valorem equivalent costs do come down. Between 1% to 3%, it is estimated for uh, red meat. Poultry meat, a bit higher than that because higher checks traditionally and also a lower value of good involved. But you can see overall there, even if you look at it on a probability basis, those non-tariff measure costs are quite significant uh, in their own right, particularly when you consider some of the relatively small profit margins that we see uh, taking place uh, within the sectors. And you can see in particular, the problem is most pronounced for the perishable products. There are issues to a lesser extent around some of the bulk products, but 
our experience suggests that uh, traders in those sectors have more experience uh, in conducting trade across a range of different geographies and also the sizes of shipments involved are much smaller and therefore the non-tariff measure costs much lower. Next slide please. So if we move on then to look to the future, you know, outside the, uh, of the EU, the UK of course is now conducting trade negotiations with other parties and there are several countries uh, in which negotiations are progressing. We hear a lot of talk about the US but perhaps need to focus also on Australia and New Zealand. Those appear to be the negotiations that are progressing most quickly and it is possible that there could be a trade agreement with those countries in place by the end of the year. And of course, Australia, New Zealand, if you look at their trade, major exporters of agricultural commodities, be that beef, dairy products and sheep meat, of course, and they conduct a relatively small proportion of trade at the moment in terms of exports with the UK. So if that UK market, if they get more access, they will certainly increase the competitive pressure. However, it's not just a one-way street, and the UK certainly is looking at opportunities elsewhere as well. The Department for International Trade has done a good job in terms of rolling over uh, its agreements uh, with countries that the UK had access to as an EU member state, so that's an importance to have in place. And longer term, the opportunities in Asia are rising with the UK's uh, application now to join the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership that should create some opportunities. However, we do need to be mindful of the distances involved as well. So therefore, where the UK's competitive advantage is, that's going to be uh, an important uh, consideration. And if we move to the next slide, please, we can see in terms of those markets where the global middle classes are emerging. And you can see versus 1985, there's been a five-fold increase in the middle class population globally. And certainly markets within Asia, be that China, India, rest of Asia, as previous speakers have mentioned, there are significant opportunities. But also one should not discount opportunities somewhat closer to field as well in terms of the Middle East markets in particular and North Africa, some growing populations there as well, and perhaps from a geographic perspective, a little bit easier to access from a UK point of view. So overall, of course, there are challenges associated with Brexit, but one should not lose sight of those opportunities as well, particularly in terms of having secured a trade agreement with the EU and now looking elsewhere to see where those opportunities lie, and particularly in the Asia Pacific region. And with that, I'm going to hand back over to our chairman. Thanks, Michael. That was great. Um, I want to jump straight uh, straight back to to Mike, actually. Uh, and if everybody can put their cameras on, that'd be great. And we'll have a kind of a bit of discussion for the next 15, 20 minutes or so. Mike, um, uh, Michael there was talking about some of the opportunities uh, that uh, that uh, we have in future. Where 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 is it from your perspective, from the lamb? So I mean, you mentioned I think kind of two percent of your current volume or trade is. Uh, non-EU. What do you expect that to be five years down the line, let's say? Uh, more. Um, that's the simple answer, Phil. Um, but um, what, what, ever since the referendum, so sort of you know, nearly three years ago now, we, we as a company have been out trying to develop non-EU export markets really as a strategy to try and you know, balance uh, our, our customer base. And it is simply a function of supply and demand. I think sometimes we get very carried away and overcomplicate things. Now, what I have learned in those three years is wherever I've gone in the world to try and sell UK lamb, you come across either a Kiwi or an Aussie who's already there and they're doing a very, very good job. And whilst I hear the comments everybody is making about the made in Britain uh, uh, profile, if you like, for our products, I have to say that simply turning up and waving a Union Jack doesn't guarantee you anything at all. Um, and many of our competitors in LAM, particularly New Zealand, will, will be able to put forward very, very good credentials around their sustainability, their farming, you know, environmental performance, uh, the quality of the product. They also have a considerably uh, strong, uh, longer shelf life. So it's not a case of simply finding market opportunities and expecting them to open up because global trade uh, other people have been doing a very good job for a long time. What is interesting, and I think it was uh, Stephen mentioned it, 
Um, I was listening to a, a Beef and Lamb New Zealand presentation a few weeks ago, and I understand that they are only able to fulfill about 60% of their quota for lamb in that Asian market. Um, and they have been drawing exports out of EU to go to serve that higher valuation market. Now, the way I look at that, what a Kiwi can't do is supply continental Europe in 24, 48 hours, whereas we can. And it might be, as Stephen was suggesting, we need to think of more imaginative ways of finding how we can operate around the world and rather going head to head with people who have very similar offerings we find ways to work in a more uh, structured and professional way to 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 bring opportunity for everyone so yes i see opportunity in the middle east uh some opportunity in the far east although i think we should probably leave that to the kiwis and the aussies to crack on with because logistically it's a nightmare and we should continue and be very thankful that we can access the European market and 500 million consumers. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, Michael, quick question for you. You kind of outlined some of the some of the challenges we've got with getting our product uh, out of the UK and into Europe now, or into any third country. What what about it the other way around? So, what about UK um, UK uh, sorry European exporters? facing challenges coming into the UK market? Because, you know, kind of, I think at the moment, we've taken quite a light touch to, to checking some of the products that are coming in. Indeed, yes, there, that is uh, correct. Uh, the border operating model that the UK is going to implement is uh, due to be a phased implementation, additional certification coming in uh, in April, and then a full implementation in July. However, we have been hearing that, you know, due to issues around access to veterinary capacity and the rest of it, that timetable could be put back. So from the other perspective, yes, it is true to say that um, the regulatory hoops that uh, importers, um, you know, taking product in from the EU have to go through are somewhat less. That said, there are issues around rules of origin, which we also needs to uh, consider and that's particularly uh, issues for those involved in supplying hubs that would serve the UK and Ireland so if it was coming from Netherlands into the UK then the product simply broken down in terms of its bulk and some of it going to Ireland a number of companies have been tripped up in terms of that so it's it's not necessarily that it's completely free of regulation it is not it is just more free flowing than what the UK exporters are experiencing yeah and I suppose it's those you know we touched on some, uh, some of those challenges that particularly around rules of origin where you've got composite food products or or you know a bit like Stephen where you've uh, you typically kind of see smaller shipments that are uh, put together in one container those are where the headaches and problems are um Nicola quick question for you India is a country that kind of we didn't really mention too much but opportunity or threat for UK agri-food well I think that's a good question I think um it's there is a lot of potential you know because of the growing middle classes the uh, affinity with the uk uh, etc but um i think there's also been a lot of government focus on india and i think that it's uh it doesn't mean that we should all rush off to india if you are a smaller or inexperienced exporter there's a hell of a lot of uh, red tape and issues to get through in any market like uh such as india um and i think that it's kind of for the more experienced exporter. So if you've already got a few markets under your belt, you know you know what you're doing. Um, it's a long-term shot. Um, and I think it's something that you can be researching and planning for and getting things in place in parallel to other markets. But it's not one just to dive into as your first uh, first export market because it is so, it is complex. Thanks, Nicola. Um, you, I mean, something you've touched on there about the, the kind of government focus uh for uh for india i'm kind of conscious that there's probably a you know a, a big push more widely in government in terms of trade and creating the the global opportunities steve i'm really interested in your thoughts about you know if you if you're a, if you did pick up the phone to liz trust what would you be asking her to do what can you what can <laughs> you make and mike i think it'd be really interesting to kind of hear your views on that as well afterwards yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, they've been going on about, you know, this trade deal with Japan. In fact, we had that anyway, and then the fact Stilton got included, we sell like a egg cup full of Stilton in Japan. So, um, you know, but I, I'm just going to go back to what Mike was saying about New Zealand because we are selling cheese in New Zealand. But, you know, New Zealand are the experts of turning um, 
milk liquid into milk solids. I mean, you're not going to do it any quick, any cheaper than they can. So it's pointless going to try and sell um, mild cheddar there because they, they can make milk powder, everything cheaper than anyone. They've got a natural, um, you know, uh, uh, advantage in the southern hemisphere of bedding weather. But, you know, we go over specialty cheeses, so they don't have, you know, the specialty cheese business in New Zealand is very, very poor. The domestic producers are not very good. I holidayed there and I was really disappointed. So, so you've really got to think outside the box, do something a little bit different. Um, and I think that's what we have to do. Don't, uh, selling commodities is one thing. We do a bit of that in some markets like the Caribbean, but, um, you know, don't try and um, compete with New Zealand on, on, on how they can do it. You know, they've got a very good thing. But certainly, um, I think you know, we need to push government up even more to get behind doing these these trade deals. Um, you know, and they're not easy. I know, you know, um, during the, the, the talks in Brexit saying, you know, the world's going to open up. But um, trade deals are not just about selling product. You know, there's all the insurances, it's financial services. The whole thing gets wrapped in together and it's um, it's quite complex. But Trade is something that you can separate out and hopefully uh, get the politicians behind it. That's what I'd encourage. Okay, so so I guess urging urging business uh, urging government to create the opportunity, and you think business will come in behind that. The other the other bit, Stephen, I heard in that was um, you know, kind of we're not a commodity producer. We're un, there's a real challenge if we go toe toe to toe for the lowest cost producer. Let's focus on what we're good at. Yeah, I mean, the southern hemisphere has advantages. You know, I mean cattle are are kept outside 12 months a year um, in New Zealand. You know, you can one guy can look after 500 cows quite easily. Uh, they don't have to come in and be fed inside. So there is a climatic slight advantage there they can produce. And, um, you know, they're very good at cooperatives. And there's been a lot of investment. I mean, you know, the big investors have been Chinese and, you know, building milk powder plants for infant formula. So um, they can produce uh, milk powder relatively cheaply to those big markets. So I, I you know I think it'd be possible to try and compete with that. But what we can do, you know, for instance, we sell a two year old farmhouse cheddar into America, uh, into Australia. I mean we you know and it and it's fantastic and, and people love it, but it's it's four times the price of um, some of the domestic cheeses. But it's I hate saying it, you know, difference to chalk and cheese, but um, but that's what it is. And and we we sort of, you know, we go on the fact that, you know, this is this is Barber's 1833 cheddar has been made on that same part since 1833. It's got heritage, it's got provenance, it's got a good story. And I think, um, you know, we've got some good stories to tell about our food. And I think that's what we need to um, try and focus on. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose when I look at, the, look at that trade data, it's, you know, the, the trend is is away from kind of the book commodities to more rallied value stuff. Mike, what, what's on your wish list for, for DEFRA or for, for Liz Trust from an international trade perspective? Help, well, uh, very quickly in that area, you know, government and the AHDB itself, of course, Phil, what, what you can do for us is to open opportunities. It's then our responsibility to step through the door and do something about it. Um, I don't think anybody is expecting an order book to be set up, you know, for, for us. But interesting listening to what Stephen was saying, because, of course, as, as lamb processors, we are in a commodity market. Um, you know, we, we actually market about 10% of all the lamb produced in the UK goes through the farmer's first business. Um, and the fact is that the Kiwis went through this pain barrier for slightly different reasons 30 years ago. And the, the key word that Stephen said that, that, that makes my ears prick up is the investment. So they got themselves sorted out 30 years ago and invested heavily in plants and things like that. Which, it, which has allowed them to do things like put 90 day shelf life on their lamb, for example. So when we turn up in Q8 and we're offering exactly the same lamb as a kiwi in terms of its nutritional content, its sustainability credentials, uh, its price, and one has a 90 day shelf life on from New Zealand and ours has a 30 day shelf life because we've got older under invested plants. It's pretty obvious which one the buyer is going to buy. So I think we have to challenge ourselves in the UK, not simply about what's ahead of us next week and the next couple of months or, you know, maybe this the next this next year. But where do we want to be in 20 years time? And if we want to be a global force for trading in 20 years time, we've got to invest heavily in our uh, processing industry at this stage so that we can match what other people around the world are able to offer. So, so Mike, let's uh, one word answer. Do you think we've got that vision for our food industry for 20 years time? And I'm interested in the rest of the panels, one word answer as well. So Mike, yes Some or no? Us. Some of us have. 
<laughs> Three words. <laughs> Nicola. Yeah, I agree. I agree with Mike. Some. Stephen, are you a sum as well? <laughs> yeah, not me though. <laughs> I'm too <obvious. laughs> Michael, I've got a slightly different question for you. I mean, I'm I'm kind of conscious that um, uh, leaving the EU creates some regulatory flexibility and some uh, some potential opportunity that we won't have had for a number of decades. And I suppose DEFRA are already taking advantage of some of that flexibility on things like the consultation around gene editing. Um, so how might anything we do around novel breeding techniques, which might be seen as a you know a positive potentially from a farming perspective? Uh, but how would they be perceived, do you think, in international markets? Are they a positive or a negative in terms of, particularly in terms of, I guess, the sort of premium export markets that we've heard about? So, Michael, interested in your thoughts. And, Stephen, I might come back to you for that as well. Yeah, I think around that, you know, if, if we take the gene editing consultation, first of all, like even within the EU, there are people there who, you know, would be supportive and open-minded in terms of the view that the UK is taking and the approach that it's going for now that it has the opportunity to do so. So I think, you know, in terms of those technologies more generally, um, I think still one would need to proceed with caution. And I think upholding the integrity of British produce, I think, is something that's that's very important and it needs to be front and centre within any consideration of uh, new technologies. But you know, they do have a role to play as well. Um, I'd be of the view they need to be looked at on a case by case basis and one needs to consider it. And one needs to consider, you know, in terms of access to the EU markets, how that would be potentially affected. I think that needs to be an important aspect of all of this. The deal is there, it does safeguard trade, but if significant changes take place, what is the EU's interpretation of that? And will they start to think, well, the standards are being lowered, the level playing field is being affected will they start to introduce retaliatory tariffs? So that, that just needs to be a consideration within all of this. And so Stephen, would, would kind of come around the thing that start to the story that you tell around your problem? Sorry, I lost you then, Phil. Sorry. Um, so if there was you know, gene editing in the UK, let's say, or kind of different regulation or standards altered, does how does that impact on the story that you can tell around uh, around the products you export? Yeah, well, I think you know we've got to we've got to go back with our um, you know our plus stories. You know, the grass fed is a big thing now. Um, good quality grass fed is is big in America now. Um, no hormones, those sort of things. Um, you know, barbers have a good story. In fact, they they use some of the original starter cultures that went back to the 1950s. They're not sort of air dried cultures which a lot of cheesemakers use. So you know, it, you, you've got to dress the product up a little bit and say it's advantages, but certainly, um, you know, grass fed is, is, a, is a big thing that's very popular now um, and those sort of things. And, and you know, general animal, animal husbandry, I mean, you know, since foot and mouth, we've really, really improved our, uh, our, our game in terms of um, how we monitor, you know, how animals move around. I think, Phil, we, 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 I absolutely agree with what Stephen is saying. We have to promote the things that we understand and can where we have an advantage, you know, whether it's the nutritional density of the lamb that we produce or the omega-3, omega-6 balance. And I'm not sure that yet as an industry, we're good enough at being able to articulate that, whether it's to UK domestic consumers or e export customers um, at the same time. And the other thing I think we have to be very careful of is some of the things that we think are terribly important are not necessarily the single most important thing to the to the export customer. I remember having a discussion with a high commissioner for a country in the Far East about lamb exports. And one of the delegation was talking about us having the highest welfare standards and producing the best product in the world, to which the commissioner said, by what measure? and who says so and that was the end of that discussion and then he said right shall we now talk about what the trading opportunities are so i think we've got to get a little bit better at understanding what we really have to offer and articulating it so there's a there's a mindset aspect in that as that you kind of touch on there mike so so nicola kind of what's your take in terms of you know the the uk not having a mindset for exporting because that, that's something i hear a little bit in policy circles now and again I think there's two things. I think there's um, people have got a mindset for exporting when it's paid for, 
<laughs> something that we see is that when you offer someone an opportunity to go to a show or meet a buyer and they don't have to pay, exports the most important thing on their agenda. As soon as you ask them to make an investment and take it seriously, all of a sudden export's not quite so attractive. Um, so I think that's one thing. I think it's that sort of commitment um, that you've got to be prepared to, to invest in export if you're going to be serious. Um, and I think also touching on Mike's point that when it comes to meeting with buyers, companies just don't do their homework. So they think that they can rock up talk about how many flavors they've got of you know crisps or whatever how, what beautiful packaging it's in but they haven't actually looked to see what are the values that Carrefour buy on and if they did that they would have a much better understanding of how to use that 20 minutes with the buyer to really try and you know what are the buttons they need to push with with him or her to, to you know to make their product stand out make the company stand out and make you know all the, the good things about Britain stand out so I understand the market. Um, look, fi final word from Mike, just one for you. It's something you touched on early on about the, the situation where you know we've still got paper-based systems, you're still having to get signatures on something physical. So what what's your take on the prospects for getting uh, all of that turned electronic? Uh, whether that's kind of like sanitary certificates, animal health certificates, what's your what's your take? How far away is that? Well, I don't grow enough as it is, Phil. I I uh... I'm not, we, we've just got to get it sorted out a, 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 as a company, we're going to be serious about it. Uh, what, what, what is my take on when, when that's likely to happen or how effectively it's going to happen? I'm, I'm not entirely optimistic in that area. But for us as a business, our export is just so central to the business. We, the attitude we take is we have to find ways to make it work. So we just crack on. Great, thank you, everybody. And and my, I suppose there's uh, there's a there's a priority there for me in terms of how do we start to try and make some of this a whole lot slicker and smoother to to support that, and it ties in with getting the mindset right as well. I think so. Thank you uh, for for everyone who's joined us. Thanks especially to our speakers. Um, as I said at the start, if you could complete the feedback survey, which will appear on your screen at the end of this webinar, that'd be much appreciated. We uh, we appreciate the feedback. Um, a reminder as well that the video will be sent to you within about 24 hours. Um, and I should also plug a couple of things that are coming up in the next uh, two to three weeks. Um, tomorrow, uh, we've got the webinar that's the horticulture focus. There's another horticulture focus on the 16th of March. Um, at the end of this month as well, uh, to March, we're taking a look at uh, beef and lamb in particular, and uh, we spoke to some, uh, some businesses that uh, uh, that were uh, potentially looking at the Brexit impact uh, at the tail end of last year. We're revisiting uh, where they are now uh, for those businesses. So check out the ahdb.org.uk and thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy your Monday afternoon. Thanks.